our very special guest, Ian Eagles, back for a second day. It's part two of our 2022 Jets preview on this special Saturday episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Saturday, September 10th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com. Thanking you for making this show your first listen or first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, and this is a daily podcast covering the New York Jets. We have new episodes each day through the week, Monday through Friday, in addition to this special Saturday episode today with Ian Eagle. If you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. You'll never miss an episode. You'll get notifications as new episodes are posted. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. It helps us out tremendously, as does giving this episode a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Our episode today is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, we we are here on this Saturday for a special episode because Jets preseason announcer Ian Eagles with us to preview the 2022 New York Jets. Part one of our interview with Ian was yesterday, so you can check that out if you missed it. We talked about Robert Sala a bit. We talked about key players on the offense like Zach Wilson and Joe Flacco. Today, the focus is going to be on the defensive side of the ball. So let's jump back into my discussion with Ian Eagle, the preseason voice of the New York Jets. The way I view it is this is a Robert Sala defense, and it really begins with line play. You have a couple of really talented guys returning, Quinn and Williams, John Franklin Myers, but also a number of additions. Carl Lawson, for all intents and purposes, is an addition to this team because he didn't play yep. last year. You, know, you traded up for Jermaine Johnson, the guy who really stood out to me in preseason. Michael Clemens, a fourth-round pick. You know, there are lots of uh, Jacob Martin signed from Houston. Lots of talent, I think, on this defensive line. And see maybe an improved part of this team on a defense that needed a lot of improvement over the offseason. Yeah, I think so. I think they can mix and match now. I think they're trying to build it in in the mold of Robert Sala in San Francisco. And, and he will mention the 49ers a bit during production meetings because, of course, that's where he had the most success in his career. That's what vaulted him to a head coaching position. I get that. And he should. He should boast about what they built with the 49ers. I think they're trying, truly. And I like the moves they made on the defensive line. Uh, I think you've got a better rotation now set up. Uh, you've got legitimate pass rushers, guys that that can collapse the pocket. I like them more on the interior than I did a year ago. You're right. Lawson is basically an addition. You know, we heard everything about him in training camp last year as he was a beast. And then he goes down in the, the scrimmage with green Bay and had to go off on his own and, and rehab. He was very emotional talking to him. I remember we met with him last year and uh, I think because he was getting so much buzz, he had just signed this huge contract. He was in just a tremendous mood in, in that meeting and this year when we met with him, he was much more serious and stoic and reflective about the last year of his life. It's isolating. You go down with that kind of injury while you try to be around the team and do your rehab, you feel separate. You feel like you're off on an island. And he acknowledged that it was hard. It was a very difficult time getting back. So his standard is very high. I, I love his drive and, and certainly his passion. Now we're going to see whether or not he can produce at the level that they thought they were going to get a year ago. But if you're asking, is that an improved part to the team? No doubt about it. And then, as you mentioned, Michael Clemens, you know, that's one of those guys who gets off the bus. You're like, whoa. Yeah, there are a few guys in a league that has physical players, there are a few guys that stand out even amongst the rank and file where you turn your head. And he is one of those guys. He is an absolute specimen. 
And he could turn out to be a serious steal as a fourth round pick out of Texas A&M. All right, and I'm taking full credit for him because right after the draft, I did a podcast and I said Clemens was the one pick I did not understand. So that was, you could, you could <laughs> print the, you could, you could make the gold jacket the second I said that there, I have a gift. Hilarious. Um, well, I, I appreciate honesty and uh, that to me is what happens in this league where, you know, there are certain, Certain picks on draft day that you scratch your head and then you fast forward a year, two years, five years, seven years, and you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, that's maybe why I, I don't do this for a living. No question about it, uh, especially me. I mean, this is my, this podcast is essentially a blooper reel if you go back at my draft takes, but let's move on to the linebacker position. Jeff made an interesting move. Uh, not that long ago, they bring in Quan Alexander to join CJ Mosley and Quincy Williams and you know, I think the defense the Jets run typically because the NFL is a league where you have three receivers on the field. You're going to see a lot of two linebacker looks. And I think Mosley is going to be yep. the guy who plays all the time. So interested your read on the Alexander move. Is he there just to add a little bit of veteran depth? Do you think he supplants Quincy Williams, who was a really solid addition last year off waivers from Jacksonville? Uh, what, what's your take? Yeah, my take was they liked the attitude that he brought, and they probably thought that was going to help the team. It would permeate. He's highly competitive, and he's someone that young guys can look up to based on his work ethic and uh, how he turned himself into a Pro Bowl player in this league. But, you know, he's five years removed from that, and certainly injury slowed him down. But there are defensive instincts there. There is uh, energy that that he brings. And I, I think the connection with Sala plays a big role. We mentioned it with San Francisco. That's important. It's important to Robert. And I think he believes in, in guys that did well under him, that he can get something out of them, how it all plays out. Look, Quincy Williams is really aggressive. He is very fast and, He's a sideline to sideline guy and he's young, you know, he's, he's 25 years old. Quan Alexander is not old. He just feels like he's been around for a while, but I think it was a combination of uh, the production he could provide, but also the attitude that he would bring to the team and just talking to, to guys, it stood out. You know, Quan's name came up quite a bit when we started talking about the new faces and leaders, he was one of the names that, that popped up in, in our meeting. So I do think there, there has been a respect level garnered in a very short period of time in that locker room. You know, the Jets made all of these additions on the defensive side of the ball this offseason. It was kind of easy for them. NFL free agency and the draft aren't that hard to navigate. Things are a little bit more difficult when you're trying to hire for, from your, for your business, though. That's where LinkedIn Jobs comes in. As you gear up for the fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. And LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the, to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you and find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Now, over the course of the offseason, the Jets made some big additions at corner. They drafted Sauce Gardner fourth overall, and they also brought in DJ Reed as a free agent from yep. Seattle. I remember a year ago, I and we were talking about their corner position, and I think we both said at that point we really didn't quite see where what they were where where the, what the end game was and the jets at the time were claiming that they loved they loved their corners you know they had bryce hall who i do think had a pretty good year last year they had brandon eccles who now slides yep. into a depth role but 
I think is a big upgrade over the course of the off season. I think sauce Gardner has got potential to be a shutdown corner. DJ Reed, really solid second corner across from him. And like I said earlier, this defense needed a lot of improvement. I think there were some big upgrades on the defensive line, but corner might be the other spot that really, I think is a lot better than it was this time a year ago. Yeah. I, I believe when they sat down, John, to, to assess this team, evaluate what they needed moving forward, cornerback had to be the first thing that they they thought of Uh, it just was an area that they couldn't quite measure up and yeah Bryce Hall did a nice job last year but this is a different level of talent Sauce Gardner has a chance to be a star corner that's different that's different than a guy that just put together a nice season Sauce Gardner you hear about the the confidence and you hear about the swag and then he walks in the room and you sit down with him. First, you realize, oh, man, this guy looks 18 years old. <laughs> you know, there's that, that moment when he walks in. Look, I'm getting older. I, I recognize this is my 25th year doing the NFL on CBS. So I went from being a pretty young guy doing this job, probably the youngest guy at the time, doing it at the network level, to an older guy that uh, when when young guys walk in, they just see me as as an older gentleman. But the flip side is when someone walks in and looks that young, it stands out. He is a young dude, but he has got real deal cockiness to what he does. He's tall. Um, he has the potential to be a lockdown corner. He's highly competitive, and I think he's got the right mentality, that attacking mentality that you look for in the special players. You know, the Jalen Ramseys that that took the league by storm because of their attitude and their skill, Sauce has got a chance to be that. Look, whenever you sit down with a young corner, you you try to get a sense of, Uh, not just the skill level, but of how they approached the game. I remember we had preseason meetings with Dean Milner and I didn't know much about him. You're just trying to, trying to learn. I didn't walk away from the meeting saying, Oh my goodness, this guy's confidence level is so high. He believes that he's going to be a lockdown guy. I walked away saying, all right, we're going to see it's, it's not written anywhere in, in Penn, just because you take a guy high at the cornerback spot, that he lives up to it. I would be very surprised if Sauce Gardner was not highly successful in the NFL. I do think the safety position is a bit of a question mark, though. Jordan Whitehead, I think, was a solid signing from Tampa Bay. But I look at that free safety spot. You have LaMarcus Joyner there, who you know, really did not play last year that much. And hasn't played safety in a long time, full time. You know, he, he came to the Jets. He had played slot corner for a few years. Behind him, you had Ashton Davis, who kind of struggled. You do have Tony Adams, the undrafted free agent. That's an area where I have a little bit of concern in the secondary. I think that's a legitimate statement. A whitehead definitely brings a little something. Uh, he was accomplished in Tampa Bay. He certainly outperformed. His draft position, he was a fourth-round pick, big hitter, also instinctive, uh, had experience as a cornerback in college, so I think is really smart and understands the defense and understands how it all works. And leader, talks a lot and is chatty and can certainly look back on his Super Bowl run as being a, a part of that group. The joiner question is real. We just haven't seen him. And it's now year nine in the NFL. He was a hybrid for many years at linebacker safety type could be an enforcer, even as a little guy, because he threw his body around and uh, liked to hit. He's very scrappy. I think it's connected in many ways to Whitehead. They seem to to have a, a good thing going, but how that actually shows up on Sundays, we know uh, if if you have leaks at the safety position, if they're not in unison, if they're not in 
constant communication, you're going to have big plays happen against you. So we're going to find out pretty quickly. And when you got Lamar Jackson in week one, you're really going to find out because you're going to need those guys. You're going to need them to patrol. Uh, that that's a that's a question and and one that they believed in in our conversations. They believe that it would be covered, that Joyner would fit in nicely and that his experience and uh, his his uh, knowledge would would help lead him. Uh, but I, I don't think you can just assume that that's all taken care of. I, I think you're you're making a fair statement on the safeties. Did the Jets finally open the season with a guy who can kick the ball through the goalposts and Greg Zorline because – it's been a rough couple of years for this team at the kicker position. In fact, I, and I'll tell you on this podcast, Eddie Pinero's full name is my new favorite player, Eddie Pinero, because the Jets got him late last season. They finally, for the first time since Jason Myers left, had somebody who could consistently make field goals. Do you think this is finally going to be a situation where the Jets have somebody who can kick the ball through the goalposts? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that, John. I, I think Greg, when he came into the league, it was fun because he had the big leg. And when it rhymes with Greg, it's great for play-by-play guys. And I remember vividly the, the, the whole Legatron run and having some, some Rams games, in fact, and getting excited about him walking onto the field and attempting some long field goals. But that's, that's a long time ago now. He made the Pro Bowl in 2017. He's an 11 year veteran. He did fine in the preseason. He, he certainly didn't do anything to cost himself the job. Obviously, they monitor it uh, during their training camp and their practices, and they felt comfortable. And Brant Boyer's been doing this for seven years and with the Jets. And the decision was made that, that Zerline was going to beat out Pinheiro for the job. But I. I can't say definitively that that it's all square. I think it, it might still be a little bit erratic and a question mark this year. The hope is the Jets are in a bunch of tight games and Zerline gets a chance to to be the hurt hero and um, it does not become a, a story. Now you want your kicker to not be the story. That's the goal. You want him to just do his job well and not worry about him week in and week out. I I don't know. I'm not I'm not going to be able to say that uh, the the Jets are all square uh, in that position. This could be a little bit of a roller coaster ride still. All right, this is my last serious question before I end with a little bit of frivolity, but it's it can be difficult to define, but how do you think this season looks for the Jets. What do you think it needs to, what do you think needs to happen for this to be a successful Jets season in 2022? Well, unfortunately the first part of it has already been affected because evaluating Zach and figuring out whether or not he's truly the, the quarterback for this team moving forward. That's, that's the first order of business. Uh, that part they need to know at the end of the season, if they're in the same boat, at the end of year two that they were in year one, uh, we've got to see more growth. They've got to see consistency more than anything else from Zach Wilson, that he can lead this offense and can find ways to win at this level. Uh, again, doesn't have to be a playoff position, but you've got to see signs of it. We saw moments in year one of his abilities, but you never saw it truly sustained week in, and week out. That's that's the most important thing that needs to come out of 2022 for the Jets. I think they're going to be much more competitive defensively than they were a year ago. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. I think they've given Zach more weapons to work with. So the personnel is uh, certainly more impressive than it was a year ago. Their depth is is in better shape than it was a year ago. Every team deals with injuries, so we recognize that as part of the game, but it's the key areas. You know, this tackle spot is a concern. And, you know, obviously you laid it out uh, defensively, whether or not this this team can show consistency at that safety position and, and take the ball away. You know, can they come up with interceptions is, 
Is Sauce Gardner going to be a guy that the teams completely try to avoid, or will he be tested time and time again? And we didn't get deep into DJ Reed. DJ has been an overachiever, originally a fifth round pick, but good speed. He's aggressive. He's physical, very confident. They paid him handsomely. They gave him a three year, $33 million deal. So their belief is that he can be a top level corner. They, they need to turn the ball over. They need to create opportunities uh, this year. And you got to see the Robert Sala defensive philosophy show itself and reveal itself. Uh, you know, clearly Jeff Ulbrich was, was a guy that, that he felt a connection with to, to run this thing. And now you, you got to see in year two, it, it bears some fruit. So look, I know everybody's going to get caught up in wins and losses because that's how you're judged realistically for this team in this 17 game format. You know, I'm, I'm thinking in that six win area, but I think competitively they should be further along than they were a year ago where they were outmanned in a lot of these games. They can go toe to toe talent wise with a lot of teams in the NFL this year. It is a great weekend of football. Of course, the NFL is opening up. It's week one, Jets, Ravens tomorrow. Also a really interesting slate of college games. And if you want to make some money, betonline.net is your number one source for all of your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. You can find all of the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week games. BetOnline is also your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It's the fastest and easiest way to check out all your favorite sports and events. And that's not just ba- that's not just football. It's also baseball, MMA, boxing, golf, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. I'm going to ask you this next question because you're the expert. Each week we do a mailbag on this podcast. And recently somebody asked me where Chris Streveler ranks among the ranks in the, among the, in Jets preseason lore. Is he the greatest Jets preseason <laughs> legend ever? And you know, you're the perfect person to ask because you've been doing their games for, you know, for so long. So, you know, I came up with names. I think he's better than Matt Sims in 2013. I think he's better than Brett Ratliff in 2008. Uh, is where Streffler rank? Is he number one? Is he the number one Jets preseason legend in all the time you've called their games? I think so. Uh, just the manner in which it happened, it's it's hard to remember any one person that that had that kind of dramatic impact in the three games that he played in, and he saw a lot of action. In addition to the fact that he literally was right off the street. I, he had no other options. It wasn't like seven teams were knocking down the door. They, yeah, they gave him a shot as, as a preseason arm. And he just brought so much energy and life when he came into the game. It just in his, the way his, his movement was coming off the sideline, he bounced into the huddle and found a rhythm very quickly and he just thought at some point the, the clock was going to strike midnight in one of these games and, and he'd come back down to earth and it never happened. He just kept making play after play after play. And it's a testament to the job that he did, that they kept him on the practice squad, that they saw a role this week, in fact, acting in, in the, the role of Lamar Jackson and trying to give the defense a good look, which you know, sometimes is very underrated in terms of preparation, fans don't get a chance to see it. Media, in fact, don't really get a chance to see it. But that plays a big part in getting ready for a game, certainly when you're taking on someone with a unique skill set like Lamar. So I'd be hard-pressed to remember. There was, a, there was a running back one year that in the final preseason game against Philadelphia just went off. And uh, I'm going to be hard pressed to remember his name. He didn't make the team. He might have had a cup of coffee on the practice squad. And I might be going back 10, 12 years. I can't remember if he was from Hofstra. I, there was some kind of local connection. And it was fun, but 
it was not at the level of, of Chris Strebler. It's not like it was happening every single game. This was every game in the preseason. They played three games. He played a, a serious role in all three games leading to victories. So uh, give, give him a ton of credit and uh, the Jets also some credit for recognizing that this wasn't just a feel good story. He, earned it. He earned a spot on the practice squad. That's the way it's supposed to be in, in a meritocracy. Now, normally this is the point of the show. Ian comes on each year. He's kind enough to join us after Jets preseason. And at the end of the show, I usually ask him about the CBS jacket that he wears on air. And I, I don't know why, but yeah. I've always been really interested in it. But I'm not going to do that this year because I'm, I'm going to make an observation because every single year Ian makes fun of me and a lot of listeners make fun of me for obsessing over Ian's jacket. Well, this year or last year, Ian called a playoff game in Buffalo, the Patriots against the Bills. And it was a very cold night in Buffalo. And Ian got a jacket from Kurt Warner and he started trending on Twitter. Everybody became obsessed with the jacket Ian Eagle was, was wearing. So Ian, I think I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you you saw the future before I did. You you are preoccupied with the jacket, so let's get back to that for a moment. That that is something that that has kept you up at night, thinking about the insignia and the embroidery and if I get a new one every year, do I just send it to the dry cleaners? How does this work? Um, I I think. Uh, there aren't enough people that that view it as important as you do. Uh, there there should be more conversation about this. So that's the end of that with a the jacket. There will be a new jacket this year, and I will wear it week one, and I will break it in. As far as the the silver bullet jacket that appeared in in the postseason, that all emanated from an appearance I made the week of the New England Buffalo game on the Rich Eisen program. And Rich asked about the the booth. What was it going to look like? What what kind of adjustments are going to be made for what was being predicted as frigid temperatures? And at that point, I didn't really have a plan in place other than dressing warm and doing my best to withstand the elements. And Rich then brought up well, you know, Kurt Warner's jacket seemed very warm, and I laughed and, and said, oh, yeah, yeah, I would I would wear that, sure. And I don't know, maybe five minutes after the interview was over, I got a text from Kurt Warner stating that he'd be happy to send me the jacket. And I don't know if it was a joke. I kind of gave it a, a laughing emoji, and I realized he was very serious, and he sent the jacket to Buffalo. Kurt is larger than me, uh, John. I don't, I don't know if, if you've done any kind of physical comps, but uh, this was a big jacket, and I am a man of my word, and I wore it at, at halftime of that game. And let me tell you, the timing couldn't have been better. The game was a blowout. I don't know if I would have been able to pull it off if it was a close game because I'm not – one to make anything about me, but it actually ended up being some comic relief in uh, a lopsided affair, and it was fun. Uh, Kurt was thrilled. I, I'm I'm not exaggerating. I, I might have gotten 20 texts from him over the course of this chain of just how excited he was. Did you get it? Uh, all of it. It was wild. It's one of those surreal moments. I'm, I'm texting with a Hall of Famer about uh, a silver jacket. I made a joke about Chippy Pop Popcorn. Uh, there were plenty of jokes. A Hershey Kiss. The, they all applied. In the end, it, it was a funny little bit, and Kurt got a, a real laugh out of it, and it really was legitimately cold in Buffalo. They tried to bring in these heaters that – they rented from like a local school and they did not do anything. Uh, literally nothing came out of those heaters that, that made me any warmer. So the jacket came in handy, but when I went back to my normal jacket, my body did not adjust well. And it was the first time that I can remember doing a game. And I've done some cold games. Chicago was one. I had one particular game in Cleveland that was rough, one in Nashville that was unexpected. This was one, say, early third quarter, 
where I was shivering to the point where it was affecting my mouth movements. And I think if you went back and, and watched the game, there were a couple of calls where you could hear it, where I, I just can't get the words out enunciation the way that I normally would based on the fact that my jaw was uh, jarred by, by the frigid cold. So maybe if Joe Namath's listening, he'll send you a jacket. Maybe that's the hope yeah. for this episode. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I would go to the fur option, but uh, I certainly am willing to take any text from any hall of fame quarterback that, that wants to provide me with fashion tips. I am before I let you go, uh, will we be able to see you this weekend or are you calling a game at the same time as the jets? I am calling a one o'clock game. I've got Pittsburgh at Cincinnati week one. I've got new England at Pittsburgh week two. And I do have Cincinnati at the jets, at least as of this moment, week three. Oh, well here you, I, you haven't called the jets game since uh, I think Pittsburgh in 19. Is that right? I think you're right. It's been a while. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you then. And hopefully the Jets are good enough that you get to call a couple more of their games this year. Ian, thank you so much. It's always so great to have you. John, you got it. We'll keep the streak going. I, I think we're we're getting to a Ripken level. I, I'm not going to count the, 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 the one stretch where uh, we, we didn't continue because uh, to me that that whole time doesn't count. That's all for our episode today. Thank you so much again to our special guest, Ian Eagle, for stopping by. Always great to chat with Ian. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day is our motto. Again, if you enjoy the show, subscribe to it wherever you get your podcast. You'll get notifications as new episodes are posted, so you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a thumbs up. Helps the channel out and helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the game tomorrow. We'll be back after it to chat about what happened between the Jets and the Ravens. Week one, NFL action.